Good morning and welcome to uh, this morning's session with uh, Dylan Hayes, who's going to be talking to us uh, this morning about uh, presenting and doing virtual presentations like this. So let me pass it over uh, to Dylan and get us started. Over to you. Thank you, Ryan. Good morning, everybody. What strange times we live in. The last DDD event I went to was in February. And at that time, we were all in the same room. It was great. We could talk to each other. You can stand in front of people and talk to them and you can actually see what they're thinking. Now, we've lost all that. Um, obviously, technology has enabled many things and the world is rich in virtual conferences, but now we're working virtually and things are slightly different. So what I want to do is talk a little bit about it now. Before we get stuck in, we have to have the obligatory sponsor messages. So obviously this is developer, 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 developer days brought to you by the kind support of our sponsors. Um, obviously we have certain ground rules, which you've probably already been familiar that we all need to be respectful of each other and that everybody has opinions that don't necessarily, don't necessarily agree with yours, but we can work together. And obviously we're going to ask you to chip in and put a bit of money into um, a cause that's all very dear to our hearts as fellow nerds. And obviously all this is possible through the generous support of a list of sponsors. So without further ado, sorry, you're not actually sharing your. Um, oh, sorry, my mistake. Right back. OK, sorry, let's let's just rewind that. Right, there we go. There we go. Yeah, sorry, my mistake. Right, so um, yeah, I'd just like to talk to you about speaking virtually and in we go. So obviously all this is possible through the generous support of sponsors. And without further ado, I'd now like to launch into my presentation correctly. Thank you, Ryan. Schoolboy error there. So obviously tweet about it, all that sort of thing. Bit of social presence is good for everybody. So let's let's talk about why we're doing this. Um, Ryan, is the uh, video feed all right? Because sometimes OBS can be a bit strange with um, PowerPoint. OK, why are we doing this? Because in 2020, everybody is a video star. Um, we all find ourselves needing to speak and communicate with people that are not in the same room. So it's gone from being something like a fringe activity to something that's completely and utterly mainstream. Now, the interesting thing is we all struggle with the medium. It's a difficult medium to work in. But interestingly enough, other people have figured out these problems already. Now, interestingly, I found that when I started to research how you can do a better job of presenting yourself virtually, a lot of these problems have been solved by gamers. So people that stream games, it's a huge business now. Um, Twitch was sold for close on a billion dollars. It's, it's a huge business and so the hardware's there, the software's there and the skills are there. So hopefully we can take advantage of some of these, the work of other people to use it in our own, in our own speaking to improve the way we speak. So I'm going to talk a little bit about this now in more detail. So what are we going to cover? Well, firstly, we're going to cover getting the basic stuff right. Obviously, I've just made a bit of a schoolboy error where I failed to actually switch my video feed over to the screen share. Um, there we go. One to me. We're going to talk a little bit about the hardware and we're going to talk about the software that enables it. And lastly, we're going to just talk a little bit about the whole thing about broadcasting yourself. Obviously, that used to be YouTube's slogan was broadcast yourself, but now we're all broadcasting ourselves all the time. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the observations I have, some of the observations for the future and just how we can work better in this very strange medium. Let's talk about getting the basic stuff right. Well, I would say one of the fundamental things is to be heard. Obviously, the quality of your audio makes a huge difference to what people see. Um, you can see in the background the rig that I'm using to bring you this talk at the moment from a previous talk, and that brings me on to the, the idea of a workspace. So the idea of the space you're working in ideally should be calm, well lit and tidy. Now what you see there doesn't quite look so tidy because I was trying to do a presentation where I was using a laptop as well. So there's a bit of a mess of cables, but the idea is that you're trying to give yourself a workspace that makes you, puts you in the right zone. 
Camera angles are kind of important as well. With a laptop, the camera typically looks from low down on your desk. We'll go into this in a bit more detail. And I just don't think it's a flattering position. Most of us haven't got Hollywood superstar chiseled chins. So a, a view from down below is just not a nice way to look. Um, microphone placement is also important to get that good quality audio. And let's talk about noise. Um, I am a fan of mechanical keyboards. I love a mechanical keyboard, but I've found that if you're doing video and you type something with a mechanical keyboard, it really does sound like heavy rain falling on a tin roof. So it's possibly time to ditch that mechanical keyboard. And I'll talk about backgrounds. That's a pet peeve of mine. So. As I said, I mentioned backgrounds as being something in the pantomime. Everybody always says it's behind you. Now, funnily enough, when you're on video, you never think about what's behind you. It's, it's really important because the image you're trying to send, if you're this is your brand, um, this is you. This is how you're presenting the organization you work for. This is how you're presenting yourself and what you're wearing is important. We all used to go to we used to visit customers and we'd wear a shirt and tie, etc. Nowadays, dress rip codes are slightly more relaxed. You have the weird situation of putting a shirt and tie on sometimes to meet a customer on a video call. But a lot of people just don't think about what's behind you. What's behind you is so important. Um, there's some things you can do technically to make it better, like avoiding bright light sources and at the same time, avoiding bright light sources and bad camera angles and also just having something that sets the right tone. In my particular case, I've got some Christmas decorations. I've got a picture. It's fairly neutral, but there's enough there to have some sense of my personality without being too cluttered or sending something. I've talked to people before where you can see a bedroom behind now an unmade messy bed. I just don't think that's the professional image you want to send. Um, obviously, you can get rid of this by having custom backgrounds. Zoom and Teams allows you to put another background in. I think novelty backgrounds are actually bad because they distract, they're not professional. And also when you impose a background, unless you're lucky enough to have a green screen, there is a slight problem in the sense that round the edge you get this weird fuzzy halo effect and you can actually see what's behind you. And I find it really distracting on a call with somebody with a custom background. I'm trying to work out what's behind them that they're trying to hide. So I'm constantly trying to look around the edges of the background. So I actually find it a distraction. I think it's better to have a decent background. And if you can't get a decent background, at least tidy it up than it is to try and hide it because you're trying to say something. I've got something to hide. So that's my view about that. I, um, in common with a lot of people, watched Joe Wicks during his PE with Joe phase over the lockdown, and I was really impressed with how well he thought about the backgrounds. He had a background there that made it look like a family room, but it was carefully created. So it set an image, which was the appropriate image, and it looked good and it worked really well. So I think backgrounds are far more important than think, people think. So obviously we come on to lighting, camera and audio. And there's an interesting thing about that, that um, 10, 15 years ago, laptops started to bit feature built in cameras and microphones. And the idea of having external hardware to do cameras and microphones just became a niche idea that was not popular. Most people didn't care about this because it wasn't something you used a lot. So essentially people cared more about the size of the laptop, the cost of the laptop and having sleek bezels than they did about the actual quality of the equipment they used. The problem with that is 2020 happened and suddenly your brand is determined by these sensors that cost literally pennies. Um, and the microphone is of poor quality, the camera is of poor quality and things like that. And that's how people see you. Um, it's not just about meetings within your own organization, but it's meetings with external customers, external suppliers and things. They perceive you through the through the lens of this tiny little camera that's positioned badly. So let, let's talk about this in a bit more detail. So I have a premise that laptop cameras are fundamentally evil for several reasons. The angle is extremely unflattering. The angle typically is below you. So and most people will gain at least one chin from that angle. It just doesn't look flattering. And also your head just looks strange. It's just not a natural view of how you see people. I think that ideally a camera angle should be more reflective of what you'd see if you were looking at somebody on their desk. And also there's a tiny lens. Now the physics are bad for a tiny lens because it lets in less light. There's going to be a darker picture. And also I find with a darker picture, you tend to get more artifacts from compression artifacts. So you end up with a, it's just not a pleasing effect. And they tend to be lower 
quality anyway than dedicated hardware. I know that some computers have better cameras than others, and it's probably a much bigger thing from now on that people care about this stuff, but traditionally laptop cameras are junk. An external camera, what's so good about an external camera? I'm talking to you on an external camera now. It's got a bigger lens, so this means it's going to gather more light. So even if the lighting conditions aren't favorable, you're going to get a decent picture, a well-lit one. They have autofocus. Sometimes autofocus is annoying if it doesn't quite work. So if you move and it constantly blurs and blurs out again. Unfortunately, it means there's some things you have to do. When, it's, when you have a laptop camera, it's very, very easy to look at the camera because it's more or less just above the keyboard. So it's a natural place to look at the camera. However, when you're using an external camera, you have to remember to look away from the screen where you might be looking and looking at the camera. Obviously, this is what television presenters do for a living, but it's much harder for us. We don't do this. Now, the interesting thing about external cameras is they have become phenomenally expensive. I was lucky enough to buy a Logitech camera that everybody says is a good one. It's been around for eight years, so it's not a new camera and the price went nuts. I bought it in early March. Now, let's just have a look at a chart of the price. And if you see here, the price was hovering around about the um, 80 to 75 pounds. I bought it around about there. In fact, I actually bought it at that point there. So it was near, it was about 75 pound at the time I bought it. The pandemic hit and the price just skyrocketed. Now, interestingly, the dotted line here, this is from Camel, 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 by the way, there was no price there. It wasn't available from Amazon. It was only available from third party sellers on Amazon and eBay, and the camera was fetching up to £300 for a used camera. Nowadays, the price has settled down to something a little bit closer to £120. But if, if nothing else illustrates the strange and perverse effects of 2020, it's just how much it costs for a premium camera. Um, obviously, the market's now flooded with other cameras, so you don't necessarily have to buy that camera to get an external camera. But for a while, they were almost unobtainable. Um, let's also talk about other things you can do with cameras. Now, I'm very fond of um, using a, a secondary camera. Sometimes you might want to have something that you are trying to illustrate that you simply can't illustrate through a screen share. Um, by way of an example, I have a secondary camera set up and I can do this sort of trick here. I can show you my desktop. So you think, what's the big deal about that? But in some particular cases, it's actually really, really useful to be able to show something on a desktop if it's a physical thing you want to demonstrate. Now, interestingly, I did a talk about DRM'd content and the screen share no longer works for DRM'd content. So I couldn't show people what's on my screen. I had to use the secondary camera to do that. So it allows you to illustrate physical processes as well. I've done a talk where I used a YubiKey to log into a laptop, and obviously you can't see that through a screen share, so I used an external camera. Now, I know some people have used an old mobile as a camera, as, and you can buy a cheap mount for it, and you can set up some software to make it into a virtual camera. I haven't actually tried that because I've been fortunate to have that, but if you are desperate for an external camera and you have a mobile, or maybe even you have a deal, you're lucky enough to have a DLSL, DSLR, you can use that as an external camera. So the important thing is that cameras matter quite a lot. Here's an example too. This is exactly the same time of day, exactly the same lighting. And this is me before I had a haircut. Um, obviously one of the effects of lockdown is um, no haircuts for a month and boy does it show. Um, on the left, you can see me from a decent enough laptop um, and the, impression you get is rather different. You're looking at my ceiling. Everything looks quite an unnatural view. This must be how you see the world as a toddler. Whereas on the right, you can see the view from the camera I'm using now. The lighting's much nicer. Shame about me, but it's just a nicer shot. To me, that's a much better shot of how you, sh how you want to look. So let's talk about audio. Audio is also important. A good audio feed makes a huge difference to how you sound. Simply put, people are more likely to listen to a well-presented voice rather than one with crackles and scratches and hisses. Um, laptop microphones are, of course, evil because they're in the dumbest place. The microphone on a laptop is next to the CPU fan and it's next to the keyboard. Those are the two noisiest things on a laptop. They're a long way from where you are. Uh, they're comparatively long way from the person talking. And the other thing is the microphones are often not very directional. So they tend to pick up a lot of background noise. So anybody that's been on a video call with somebody in a poor choice of room will know just how much noise you get. So 
Let's just compare that with an external microphone. They tend to be heavy and expensive. They're very directional. The great thing about that is if next door's dog is going to have a fit of barking at the postman, it tends not to be picked up. Your, your laptop or the noise of your computer is less picked up. You can position it with a boom or stand, which is what I'm using now, or you can get a desk mount, and they just typically sound better. Now, what I'm going to do is actually play you some samples of that to, just to illustrate exactly what I mean. So let's compare. Now, if this works, this was recorded on a laptop. This next one here, I, I'm assuming the audio is coming through from Teams. Um, just ping a question if it's not coming through and we can skip this or I can make the make it available. This is a wired headset. As you can hear, the audio there sounds all right. It's quite quiet. Obviously, the levels are different, but it sounds quite clipped to me. This is some high-end Bluetooth headphones. And then the microphone on my camera. And lastly, a USB microphone on a boom. Now, my observation from that, hopefully it is actually borne out in what you hear at the other end, is that the laptop sounds all right, but it, the sound isn't good. The wired headset is surprisingly less good than you think it's going to be because of the microphone is positioned right in front of your mouth in something like this. The microphone is very close to your mouth, so you get a good, nice signal. But the problem is it tends to sound a bit blown out and you end up sounding a bit like an airline pilot rather than somebody doing a presenter. OK. OK, I just seen the questions there. I was just about to say to you, um, we seem to have some technical difficulties with those coming through. I don't know whether that's due to OBS not capturing audio from PowerPoint. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure it should have come through. What I'll do is I'll make them available as a file share afterwards. So I do apologize. I was I tested this before, but there we go. These things happen, don't they? I'll move on now. Thank you. Um, I'll make the samples available so you can hear the difference because it is quite a difference. So let's let's just move on now. Oh, for that, All right, there we go. OK, let's talk about lights. Now I can demonstrate the lights. I do apologize for that. The gremlins got got me there. Now I would say on lighting, one of the main things is that overhead lighting is not good because it tends to cast shadows on your face and from behind you is terrible because you get a big flaring effect. So you'll either be a silhouette or the camera will really struggle to adjust adjust the levels to so that your face is visible rather than the lighting behind you. So if you can avoid lights behind you, go for it. Um, sunlight is your enemy, which as um, developers, we're all familiar that sun, there's the popular image of developers being afraid of sunlight. So if you're a broadcaster, you really are afraid of sunlight because the sunlight starts streaming in through the window at a certain point and suddenly you either get some weird stripes across your face from the blinds or you suddenly start to have some other other weird effects going on and the, the auto white balance in most cameras gets completely confused about that so if you can block out sunlight and use artificial lighting for your talking it's much much better ideally your lighting needs to be from the direction of the camera you can buy ring lights i've experimented with ring lights and i found that um, it's, it's not perfect because your face can look very washed out sometimes with it and it's quite hard to stare into the light so if you can just get some soft fairly good lighting behind the monitors that lights the room from that direction, then it'll it'll light you quite well. It's very strong ring lights and things also tend to reflect off your glasses as well, so you can get some weird effects. Um, the thing to do with lighting is to plug your camera in and test and test and test and see whether you're happy with the arrangement. That's, that's what I find works at the end of the day, is just to keep testing and find out what works for you. And lastly, next thing we come to, of course, We've dealt with the hardware. Now let's talk about the software that makes it all possible. Um, open broadcasting software has become, it's been around for some years. It's very much a general purpose um, tool. It, uh, it's free open source, which is great. It's quite mature. 
It's a general purpose tool for most forms of video. Um, it does audio as well, but I'll come into the little bits of details about how that works as Teams. It's just demonstrated it hasn't worked very well with Teams, but I'll, I'll come to that. Now, the problem is the documentation is not great. Um, there are a lot of features, but the documentation is poor. There are blogs around that explains how to do those sort of things. There are there is some help and you can find YouTube videos and things, but there's a lot to learn. The first time I picked up OBS to try and work out how to do virtual talks, I found I really, really struggled to get started with OBS. We'll have a look at the tool in a moment. It is a good tool, but it is just quite quite a struggle. Um, there are alternatives, but they tend to be niche, that they're either commercial software, which is quite expensive, or they are very much geared towards the need of game streamers who want to be able to have lots of graphics crawling around the screen and things like that, which is probably not what you want for a professional image. Now, what I'm going to do now, just to show you a little bit of OBS, as you can see, this is the OBS window where this thing's been run from. You can see this here, so you can see my background. And I've done a little trick here where I'm feeding my video into, rather than doing a screen share, I'm feeding my video into my screen. So that's a little bit about what OBS looks like. It's um, it's, a, it's a it's a really good piece of software. It just doesn't welcome you. What would be really nice if there was a wizard that just walked you through, bam, 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 this is what you need to do. And unfortunately, it's just not like that. So I find that um, one of the underappreciated parts of windows is or any, indeed any operating system when you're doing a presentation is that virtual desktops are your friend i've always found that i've really really struggled when i'm doing a demo where the demo features in the one hand a slide deck and then another place where i go off to do something in a web browser or do something in code in visual studio and things like that and i've found i've really struggled with moving from one to the other and the irony is that there was a really simple solution to this all along and i never actually thought of doing it and these the simple answer is that if you use virtual desktops and you put your PowerPoint on one virtual desktop and you put the stuff that you're trying to demo on another virtual desktop and even maybe if you have a backup video for if the demo fails on another virtual desktop, you can simply th flick through virtual desktops. I've got another virtual desktop here and I can literally press a button and I can go to something else. You'd imagine this would be code or a browser window or anything you like so you can rapidly move from one place to another which makes it so much easier the keyboard shortcut makes it super easy so virtual desktops are very useful there is one little trick to do with a virtual desktop in windows if you're lucky enough to have um, two screen pardon me if you're lucky enough to have multiple screens i find it's best if you concentrate all of your um, production on one screen left or right screen depends on your preferences and you do your actual talking, the content goes on another screen. And what you can do is that when you click on a window inside of um, in your virtual desktops, you can pin that window to all the virtual desktops. So for example, Teams and OBS, when you flick between virtual desktops, it's gonna change on both windows. So what you want to do is if you just simply say, show this window on all desktops, it means you don't lose OBS, you don't lose Teams when you flip between virtual desktops, because there's nothing quite as bad as flipping virtual desktop, and you lose Teams and everything, and suddenly you feel very, very lost. So <laughs> it's, it's a little trick for you. Again, it's a, it's a simple thing that when you see, in fact, I'm going to demonstrate to you. When you see this point here, one of the options here is you can say, show this window on all desktops. So that really does make it easier. You can show all windows from this app and that just that just makes your life just so much easier. So it means you don't lose your presentation tools when you decide to flick virtual desktops. That's what I'm doing on the right hand screen here, which I'm not sharing, but um, that's what you would see if I was sharing that screen. Obviously, it's very difficult to show you how to produce something in OBS when I'm using OBS to, to produce it. It gets a bit meta then. So. In OBS, the key component, I would say, of OBS is something called a scene. Now, a scene is a collection of different objects, text, a basic set of scenes, etc. So I'm going to show you a little bit about my OBS. So I'm going to flick over to another virtual desktop and I'm going to drag OBS in here. Now, we've got a very weird thing going on here because OBS is showing itself and it's just inception, isn't it? My mouse disappearing off into the distance. So if you, um, unfortunately, I can't dismiss that because I would also disappear. <laughs> but what I can show you, uh, let's just see, if I change the camera to just me for now, 
I can see you can see in OBS there are several scenes here. Now in OBS you can have a scene. The scene we're on at the moment has my Twitter handle, a little bit of background here, um, the camera feed which is obviously here and it has a mic input. Now OBS is capable of processing audio but it doesn't send it to teams so unless you're going to go invest in some extra software to do something where you set up a virtual microphone for the most part the microphone goes straight into teams so don't worry about the audio so sorry, just sharing your uh, camera feed at this point. oh sorry my mistake okay is this better yeah yeah sorry we've just gone off into a meta world okay so back in obs <laughs> this is really hard it's like patting your it's like patting your stomach and rubbing your head at the same time. Um, inside of OBS here, I've got a variety of different scenes. Now I'm not going to change scene because you'll lose me again. So you find that this scene here is made of the desktop and I've created a little camera window here that I'm sharing into this and then there's the microphone. Unfortunately, I can show you the other. You can see that there's a variety of other scenes here, but I'm not going to actually click on those scenes because you'll no longer be able to see me because you're not in the same room. This would be so much easier to talk if we're actually in the same room, wouldn't it? Um, so I have I have a variety of other scenes and what I typically do is I set up one scene as a test card, which effectively is like here's a signal when there's nobody there. So that's saying we'll be back soon. Um, you set up another one with the video camera large, which is what you can see here. And you also set up another one if you are using a secondary camera as I am, which you can see here and you can see me using a little tool which we'll come to in a minute. So if I go back to sharing my screen and then bring this across here and then go back to my desktop, hopefully we can see the slide deck again. Now, yeah. It's, it's an interesting one here. We're going to talk about cognitive load in a minute, and that's quite a lot of cognitive load for me as a presenter, all of those things to get right, and also do your pre presentation at the same time. So it's an interesting one. So like I said before, I've, I typically set up a couple of different scenes where you have a, please wait, we'll be right back. Um, those of you who are into Fallout can use the one from Fallout because that, that, that's quite fun to have. You can make them fun if you want, or you can make them boring. You have a main camera, and you can have a desktop with the mini me that you're seeing here and a secondary camera. Now, there is one caveat with um, using the desktop where you have yourself in the camera in the corner. I find in a regular Teams meeting, in a regular Teams meeting, basically the quality of sharing a screen through OBS is no, nowhere near as good as what you get if you share a screen through a regular screen share. Obviously, there's some negotiation of protocols that goes on between Teams and OBS, and basically Teams seems to default to the lower quality streams. So if you're doing PowerPoint, it's usually okay, but if you're trying to do something like showing code or something that requires intricate detail, it just doesn't do a good job. So for PowerPoints, the way I'm sharing a screen is fine, but if you wanted to demonstrate code, it's just not going to work. I don't know whether it works better with Street with Teams Live, but in general, you'll probably find the picture you're seeing from me just isn't as good as what you'd get if I was sharing the screen in a regular way. But the nice thing is you can have a little talking head in the bottom, whereas I hate presentations where somebody is just showing you a PowerPoint, a PowerPoint, and there's no person behind it. It's very inhuman and it's really hard to stay engaged. So that's a little bit about what you can do with scenes. You can flick around from scenes, but beware, obviously, that you're not lucky enough to have somebody watching your back, as Ryan is with me, uh, to tell you, actually, you've flicked away from the scene and you're sending completely the wrong thing. So, oh yeah, I can see somebody says obsession. It is, it is just really tough on your brain sometimes. So, but I love OBS. Um, what I've done is I've done some extra things with OBS. I'm not going to show on here where you can set up a mask. Um, very 2020, isn't it? Using a mask so you could actually have yourself appearing in a round camera. Um, I'm going to try and flick over to that now, but this, this could all go horribly wrong. You can have collections of screens. So I'm going to use the one I use for work. And if the demo gods are smiling with me, and now, now it's back to camera. Let's go back to desktop. And if we go full screen plus camera, can you see me now? Yeah. Can you see me in a nice little round hole? Yeah. 
Ah, fantastic. Right. Now I'm going to have to navigate myself back to where I was without confusing myself and losing my video. But there are there's some really fun stuff you can do. What you can do with OBS, you can set up a you can put company logos into there. You can make your um, you, you can make your video in a round. You can make your video in a round hole. Excuse me about I'm having an interruption from my son. The, the joys of presenting remotely, uh, as, as we all probably know in this this day and age that you know we do get interruptions from the rest of the family as as and when like like as has happened just then. OK, it's kind of like that thing that everybody laughed about five years ago with that guy in Korea, wasn't it, where his family walked in and I just had one of those near things. This is, of course, where you need to have your be right back type video, isn't it? But let's just go back to our original um, Let's just get OBS back on the room. Um, hopefully you should be seeing the original video now. Are we good for that? Yep, we're good. OK, fantastic. Sorry that. Um, interestingly enough, one of the things I'm going to refer to later is cognitive load, and that is a definite advantage. That is a definite demonstration of high cognitive load um, where I'm trying to navigate this. I'm trying to talk to you all and my son is threatening to bang the door down, asking how much longer are you going to be on this call? Um, which is a very 2020 moment. Um, I've toyed with the idea of having a little red light on the door saying on air, but what you actually need to do is have soundproofing and a lock, don't you, to make yourself safe from these interruptions. So that's a little bit about some of the things you can do with OBS. I mean, those of you of a technical nature can really go crazy on all of this and have some lovely stuff. I, I just, to me, um, in such an impersonal time, I like the idea of having a PowerPoint and me talking to the PowerPoint, and I'm prepared to suffer the loss of quality for that to be able to do that. But like I said, it just doesn't work very well if you're trying to demonstrate code, and it all depends on people's quality of internet connection and all sorts of things can end up with it being quite scrambled. But for the purposes of a PowerPoint, I'd rather I was talking in the corner so you can see me, you can see some infliction, you've got some, some human there rather than just looking at PowerPoint, because realistically, um, life's too short to spend time looking at a PowerPoint and not pay and not face. We're social creatures. We don't like that. If I just go on to the next slide, um, we talked about getting fancy. So you've seen a little demonstration of some of those things there where you can build your own scenes. So OBS has some amazing powers in that particular department. You can do some really, really clever stuff. Um, the problem is the documentation is terrible. There are blogs out there to help you, but I've found some of the things that you can do as a starting point is simply if you get your regular camera feed and you put your Twitter handle on there. If you're at work, putting your company logo is good in there. Now, Teams does slightly um, mess with you in that sense because Teams will try and pan to keep your face in there. So you'll find that the company logo sort of shuffles in, shuffles out of the view and it gets truncated. But it's still a nice thing to have a corporate logo in the feed. So if you're talking to a customer or something like that, people can identify who you are. Bit of branding. Um, we talked about the effects with the round camera. Um, it took me ages to figure out how to do that. Um, I'm just going to promote my blog at the bottom. I'll post um, a link to my blog and it tells you how to do that because I never actually found out anybody who could do that in OBS with clear instructions. So I wrote some instructions. The one thing I'd warn you with is that ultimately um, the camera is about you and anything that distracts it. So if you have screen crawlers, I don't know if any, any of you have ever watched some of these game streamers where they have all this stuff going on the screen. It just looks like an angry fruit salad. It's like back in the early days of the web where everything's just a mess of color and action and things like that. And the actual person in the middle is completely and utterly lost underneath this vomiting of color and animation and things. So I would say if you're not sure whether you should put it in or not, just, just be careful. Just be careful. It's good to show off that you can do these things and it's fun to do these things, but you, you don't want to go for something that looks like CNN or Fox News. Um, we're not in that business. So um, I'd like to talk. We've been talking about software so far, but now we're going to talk about something that's part software, part hardware. Um, there is this one. As I said, the streamers have solved some of our problems. One of the problems with giving a presentation is that you have the cognitive load of clicking through the slide decks and being able to change your video and things like that. And if you're having to resort to keyboard shortcuts, quite frankly, I'm not clever enough to be able to manage the keyboard shortcuts, look at the camera, 
talk and get all these things right. Even then, even with some help, obviously you've seen me make a bit of a mess. So it, it's a tough thing. So thankfully, um, there is this thing called a stream deck and effectively a stream deck is a bunch of different macros that you can run to do different things. You can see a picture of it on the slide deck now, and I'm just gonna kick over to my secondary camera and you can actually see the little thing on my desk. So the nice thing about it is that you can you could get them in various sizes. Um, this one is still quite expensive. This one set me back 70 pound. Don't tell my wife. Um, you can get a much bigger one that goes for about 120. And then there's a massive one, which is the best part of 200 pound. But all of them, the principle is you can effectively program macros. So these buttons here reflect the different video sources I might want to try. So if I press this one, for example, it'll disappear back to there. So if we go back to here, and these are how I page in through my um, virtual desktop. So I can again flick through a virtual desktop, which you can't see. Obviously, it's very, very hard to show this. I suppose I could put my camera here. This is where it gets seriously meta. So you can see I can flick through my virtual desktops here by using this. So what I'm going to try and do now is remember to come back to the right one. So hopefully now you're seeing my slide deck again and me in the corner. Now, um, it, it's really, really good. The, the idea is when you've got six buttons, you can do things like use it to move between virtual desktops um, and then you can flick between your different scenes. As I said before, it's useful to have a second. If you have a secondary camera, you have a test card saying be right back, a full screen camera and then a screen with a camera and a picture and a picture type thing. So you can rapidly flick through this. So Hi, ideally, because it's all shortcuts and it's got little icons, you can see what's going on. If I just go back to this. Because they're all nice little icons here, I can choose those icons. It's something that's easy and memorable. So your muscle memory can pretty much remember where everything is. So almost, he says. So your muscle memory can remember what to do this. So you can carry on talking and change it. Whereas if you're relying on keyboard shortcuts, it's much tougher. And obviously if it's a complicated set of keyboard shortcuts, there's the real danger you press the wrong keyboard shortcut and you shut down your machine or close OBS or something like that. Now, the people that make this also make a virtual screen deck so you can make your mobile into a virtual stream deck, but it's a service. So you have to pay a couple of dollars a month for this service. I considered one of those, but in the end, I decided that um, hitting buttons on a dedicated piece of hardware is so much easier than getting your mobile set up because you can more or less do this by touch without having to do anything. So I'm a big fan of Screen Deck. The six button one is actually pretty good for those starting out. I kind of wish I had the bigger one, um, but 120 pounds, a lot of money just for a geek toy, isn't it? Um, depends on your budgeting really, but then, you know, we're spending our lives doing this. So anything that makes it a bit easier is great. If you if you had the extra buttons, you could do things like I could program my lights in it. I've got hue lights all around me, so I might decide one of them to have a macro to change my lighting. I'm not quite sure how that is relevant to doing a presentation, but hey, it's there if you need it. So you can hit your stream deck to shortcut. So let, let's talk a little bit about the medium and the message. Now, as I've demonstrated before, um, there's a lot going on. In the good old days, when we stood in front of a room, you more or less had PowerPoint and you could have a clicker and you just click through there. And apart from the difficult bit of switching between a demo and switch, switching between using something in a demo and the PowerPoint deck, your cognitive load isn't that bad. Now, interestingly enough, when you're talking in front of people, um, that should hopefully be taking a lot of your brain because you're concentrating on this to do it all right. So that means there's very little of your brain left to do other things. So if you've given yourself complicated things in addition, you're just not gonna be able to do things. I mean, I'm just not capable of doing something like talking, doing the demo, and actually running the production. Now, uh, obviously, if we were broadcasters, professional broadcasters, they have a whole studio full of people. There's somebody there as a producer who does this stuff for you. Now, we have no such luxury when we're speaking virtually. We have to be our own producers. We have to be our own producers as well. So anything you can do to cut down your cognitive load. Like swimming and get my water. Sorry about that, that's uncalled for. <laughs> um, 
if we talk about lessons learned and I've managed to click on my. OK, so we talk about the cognitive load. And this is even before we get um, interruptions from random children. I do apologize about that. <laughs> it's almost like if you tell him do not blunder into the room, he's guaranteed to blunder into the room, isn't it? This is one of the things we have. So. We're talking about the cognitive load of all these things going on. So it's actually quite tough to produce the show, talk through the content, and do all these things at once. So anything you can do that makes it easier is good. So I, which comes on to the point of, you should really practice in the medium as well as the message. So take as many opportunities as you can to make sure this stuff works. And it's not just making sure the hardware works because there's a lot of potential for glitches. OBS is sometimes decides that it really doesn't want to talk to the camera anymore. And that's usually two minutes before you're on live. It's also just practicing. So you could switch sources and hopefully do that in a way that doesn't cause you any huge problems just trying to manage all this stuff so again it's practice and familiarity i've done quite a lot of this and i still struggle with some stuff it really is weird um i guess this is what it's like being a pilot pilots talk about the need that you have to aviate that's fly the plane communicate and then navigate trying to do all of those things at once and they've all they've all putting cognitive load on you and it's all contradictory if you concentrate on one you forget to do the other one so if you start battling with the hardware you can end up fighting with the hardware and completely losing your thread of where you are in the talk and obviously we have um, this being 2020 we have interruptions from family is more or less taken for granted i find that i often have a 10 o'clock meeting and pretty much reliably regardless of whether i put a post-it note on the door to the amazon delivery driver the amazon delivery driver will attempt to either put it through the letterbox where it clearly doesn't fit or attempt to demolish the door by knocking so hard regardless of what you do that's what happens so all of those things affect your ability to communicate so let's, um, as we're starting to reach the end of the talk, let's talk about some lessons learned in 2020. Now, 2020 is a year like no other. I'm not gonna bother with the cliches, but we'll talk about it. So I was just thinking about what are the things we used to do on video in, yeah. So in previous years, what would we do over video? Well, very rarely a customer meeting. Usually we would meet them, but sometimes we'd have a customer meeting over video it was still slightly weird slightly niche um, and it was just as likely to be a conference call as it was to be an actual video meeting at that point it was fairly niche and occasionally if you have families scattered over the country and world you might have a family video call but this was typically one-to-one -one or one to a few and it's a, it's a different sort of thing that you're communicating together rather than broadcasting yourself it's really quite different so I'd, I'd say for most people, that was the extent of our interactions over video. Some of us might have done conferences first, might have done virtual conferences, but generally it was a fairly rare thing. Most of us were used to sitting in the same room and talking to each other. So let's talk about what we do for, uh, let's talk about 2020. So what have we done over video in 2020? Well, for me, um, scouting. I volunteer in scouting and obviously come March we were no longer able to meet in person so we had to try and work out some way of making scouting work over Zoom. Um, it was pretty tough. You imagine that the attention span of um, primary school age children and getting them to sit in a video meeting and actually feel engaged that is a really tough audience because they'll start mucking around and you you can't stop them, but you want them to have a fun time and you want them to come back next week. So we managed that for some months. We kept going. We lost a few people on the way, but we did actually manage to do a fairly good job of making scouting exciting. Over video, we've even invented games because scouting is very critical to games. We invented games to get the audience to participate and engage. I'm, I'm very fond in my talks when we're actually in the same room of doing some interactivity. So we tried to bring the same interactivity to a video. Obviously, customer meetings. I now have gone to the dark side and I spend quite a lot of my time on sales and consultancy type stuff. So meeting customers by video is pretty much the norm. I think since March, I've met one customer in the same room and that was the thing that felt weird. Meeting customers um, over video is now the default behavior. And I honestly can't see that changing even when there's a vaccine and even when people are able to go back to the office. I think for some reason, I think in some ways we're, we're going to struggle to go back to face to face meetings unless it's really important to our first meeting. I think video is the default now. Obviously, internal company meetings, we've all been to tons of internal company meetings over Teams and Zoom. It's 
again, that's become the default. Some of these meetings are terrible. Some of these meetings are quite fun, but it depends. But that's very much the default again. And sales calls. I've done sales calls over video, which is a strange thing. Obviously, it's not cold calling, but you are talking to a customer at the early stages of engagement over video. It's quite a different way of talking to somebody than you would if you met them or if it was a phone call. Um, hackathons. I did a customer hackathon yesterday over Teams. Um, which was actually really fun, but it was so much harder. It wasn't helped by the fact that Teams decided to have a major outage yesterday, which uh, just increased the uh, friction of getting everybody to work together just so much more. Public speaking, well, we're public speaking now. I think I've done about 15, 10 to 15 events like this, so you gradually get used to it. Obviously, family video calls, yep, we all do that. Family quizzes, again, that's become a 2020 tradition. I've had a doctor's appointment over video. That was slightly weird. I've also got completely smashed with a friend of mine drinking whiskey over video. Again, that's a slightly weird thing, but that's a 2020 thing. If you told my year ago self that this would become normal, I think I would have looked at you like you're from some strange alternative universe. It's like, why would you sit in front of a computer drinking whiskey with a friend of yours who's several hundred miles away? You know, what, what's wrong with the world? And lastly, I used video to guest appearance on a um, podcast as well. So all of these things we're doing in 2020 are on video and they're just not going to go away. The interesting thing is, I think that the world has changed and largely we're going to become used to it. But still, as human beings, fundamentally, we like to be in the room. We like to see people's faces. We like all of these things. So we're really going to struggle. It, it's it's a hard medium to work in. Um, so at this point, I'm just about getting to the point where I'm going to wrap up. I wanted to um, allow a little bit of time for some questions and answers at the end, if any of you have them. So um, I'm going to lead it to some closing thoughts. And as far as I'm concerned about video, the genie has escaped the bottle, regardless of when there's a vaccine. And if we all take it and Corona becomes history, we're just not going to go back to this time before that. Um, by default, I think so many technical events are going to be primarily video and maybe there will be a niche part of it or even we have hybrid events. I think hybrid events could be big. Uh, we're talking about doing that with scouting where we will have some actual events and some video events just to keep people up to date. But the genie has definitely escaped the bottle. The world has changed and now it is very, very normal to communicate with people far away through the magic of video and as humans it's going to take us a long time to adapt because we adapt very very slowly the technology adapts quickly so it's going to take us quite a while so with that i would like to wrap up and i will look at some questions and i do apologize for the audio demonstration not going as planned um, teams is so good at suppressing noise that it decided to suppress my speakers um, but i will make those available as I'll, I'll make those available to anybody who's interested, but suffice to say, the USB microphone just sounds head and shoulders better than any other microphone. So with that, I'd like to have a look and see whether anybody's got, anybody's got any questions. So the only thing I can see um, is that somebody was just mentioning instead of using OBS, um, if they're on a Mac, you can use a, a paid product called Ecamm. Mm -hmm. uh, apparently it's a lot friendlier and better documented than OBS. Um, so that's an option if you're on Mac, but there are other options as well on Windows. Um, yeah. OBS just tends to be the one that, that we see more you, people using. Um, yeah, because the thing about OBS is OBS is now, I didn't want to get into the detail of it. I'll post a link to my blog afterwards that goes into the nitty gritty of all the versions, but OBS now has something called virtual camera built in and to use it with Teams and Zoom, you need to have um, that in the in most cases to use it in everyday life, you need to have the virtual camera. It's now built into OBS on Windows, but on the Mac, you have to install an extra plugin. So unless you're quite technical, you, you need to mess around with a plugin. So some of the Mac software has that just out of the box, doesn't it? So we have had a couple of questions just come in. Um, first one is from Niraj and is asking, um, do you recommend animations in PowerPoint? And do you or do you find it too distracting? Now, I'll, I'll let you answer this one because I've got a, a view <laughs> on it as well. Yeah, it's it's an interesting one because I 
sometimes I've used animations there very, very sparingly to hide something until I wanted to show it, because if it's if if the item is distracting to show it when you open the slide initially, I would suggest hiding it, but I'm really not a fan of it sort of spinning in and things like that. I think that can be very distracting. So you have to you have to say to yourself, does the animation add value? In other words, does it improve your presentation or is it simply whizzy graphics? And likewise, all of those things that you can do in PowerPoint, you should use that filter on there because one of the things that makes me almost sick to see is the terrible, terrible Windows clip art that used to be there with the stick figures and things. And when I see those in a PowerPoint presentation, especially if they're animated, at that point, I really need to reach for a sick bag. But that, that's my opinion. I'd be curious to see what Ryan thinks. So I think animations um, can be used and can be uh, really, really good for building the, the flow of your deck. Mm -hmm. uh, particularly as you're, you're going through different slides, bringing in different bits of the, the content that you want to talk around. So they can be useful, but it, there are some an, uh, some of the animations that I, I by default will just never use, um, like the spinny um, text one where it spins around and then stops. That one's quite um, quite visually distorting, I, th I find. Um, so sort of the ones that I kind of find that work well are fly in from the bottom. Mm -hmm or just appear. Um, yeah, so those those ones work quite well. Um, I think the key thing with with animations is use them sparingly. Um, when you when you don't need to, you know, you don't need to do every uh, every line on a pay on a on a slide unless, of course, you want to have a conversation around the, the points that you've got in in a slide. Um, yeah. That, that's a good point, actually, because appear is fine and slide in is fine and sometimes fade. But those animations are ways of something discreetly appearing, whereas if something comes spinning across the screen, you're actually you're, you're confusing the medium with the message. You're going to see the medium and not the message. So I would say it's a it's a complete distraction. So I, I think I would agree with you in there. Use sparingly. The other point about PowerPoint in general is I there's two schools of thought. One of them is that you put quite detailed bullet points on there and explain everything. So if somebody didn't attend the shut, didn't attend the session, they can figure out what's going on. And the other one is to say, keep it really, really minimal. Um, as an example of that, I did a talk last year on cognitive services and the slide deck I had in the first instance had a whole load of things about how AI and um, speech processing is ubiquitous and everywhere. And I, I realized there's about 30 words on the screen and I chopped it down and I got it down to under 10. And then I realized that actually all I need to do is have a picture of an Alexa. And at that point, my point is made. AI is ubiquitous and useful and it's out there. Yeah, I think it, it's always an interesting thing looking at your presentation decks that you've done before and then how can I rework them? But yeah, um, animations are, it, uh, I'll go, and I'll give a consultant type uh, uh, response. It depends. It depends. And yes. Use them. Use them where they where they are appropriate. Yeah. Uh, the other one that's come in is around uh, hybrid events. Now, um, myself, I I also organise um, other events. Um, so we're looking at doing hybrid in the future. So we will have a, a virtual esque event that will be as a sort of a supplement if you like to the in-person event um it's, it's the plan of thinking for for events in 2021 and i think i think we will see a lot more hybrid events in future yeah no i, I would agree because i remember i did a talk in london in march and this was a week and a half before lockdown and so everybody was aware that there was a problem but people still turned up to an event and I went to an event and you normally expect 50 people at this particular event and as it happened there were 20 people in the room and there were probably a further 50 people watching online and at that time it was a it was a slightly weird thing because it, a hybrid event is very very distracting because you look at the people in the audience and you forget the people that are watching um, but that was the first time I did a hybrid event where it was build as a hybrid event rather than there's there's a recording but i think that's going to be the future and that's going to be a whole series of new things to learn um at the user group i work with we're debating the idea of having a cadence where we have regular short 
virtual events and then longer physical meetups so that we try and get the best of both worlds. Yeah, it's uh, as an organizer of a user group and uh, events like this, it's a challenge to work out what the balance is um, yeah. and, and get the right balance for, for all attendees. So yeah, it's something that hybrid hybrid is going to be the way forward. It always was when you think of it from an infrastructure point of view. Um, hybrid clouds was always going to mm -hmm. be part of the, the way forward. It's the same with, with how, we, how we do um, sessions like this. Yeah, that it was a re really good session this morning, Dylan. Um, okay, thank you. We're almost at time and there's no no other questions uh, that have come up. So at this point, what I'll do is I'll end the recording. Okay, that's absolutely fine. So, I'll try and post on Twitter the different audio if anybody wants to compare. I do need to just make it. I do apologise that that didn't play, <laughs> but the gremlins are there. This is the problem with not being in the same room. Well, thank you for listening and thank you, Ryan, for hosting.